the Scarecrow went sorrowfully back to his friends and told them what Oz had said. And Dorothy was surprised to find that the Great Wizard was not a head as she had seen him, but a lovely lady. All the same, she needs a heart as much as the Tin Woodman. On the next morning, the soldier with the green whiskers came to the Tin Woodman and said, Oz has sent for you. Follow me. So the Tin Woodman followed him and came to the great throne room. He did not know whether he would find Oz a lovely lady or a head, but he hoped it would be the lovely lady. He said to himself, For if it is the head, I am sure I shall not be given a heart, since a head has no heart of its own, and therefore cannot feel for me. But if it is the lovely lady, I shall beg hard for a heart, for all ladies are themselves said to be kindly hearted. But when the woodman entered the great throne room, he saw neither the head nor the lady, for Oz had taken the shape of a most terrible beast. It was nearly as big as an elephant, and the green throne seemed hardly strong enough to hold its weight. The beast had a head like that of a rhinoceros, only there were five eyes in its face. There were five long arms growing out of its body, and it also had five long, slim legs. Thick, woolly hair covered every part of it, and a more dreadful-looking monster could not be imagined. It was fortunate the Tin Woodman had no heart at that moment, for it would have beat loud and fast from terror. But being only tin, the Woodman was not at all afraid, although he was much disappointed. The beast spoke in a voice that was one great roar. I am Oz, the great and terrible! Who are you, and why do you seek me? I am a woodman, and made of tin. Therefore I have no heart, and cannot love. I pray you to give me a heart, that I may be as other men are. Why should I do this? Because I ask it, and you alone can grant my request. Oz gave a low growl at this, but said gruffly, If you indeed desire a heart, you must earn it. How? Help Dorothy to kill the Wicked Witch of the West. When the witch is dead, come to me, and I will then give you the biggest and kindest and most loving heart in all the land of Oz. So the Tin Woodman was forced to return sorrowfully to his friends and tell them of the terrible beast he had seen. They all wondered greatly at the many forms the great wizard could take upon himself. And the lion said, If he is a beast when I go to see him, I shall roar my loudest and so frighten him that he will grant all I ask. And if he is the lovely lady, I shall pretend to spring upon her and so compel her to do my bidding. And if he is the great head, he will be at my mercy for I will roll this head all about the room until he promises to give us what we desire. So be of good cheer, my friends, for all will yet be well. The next morning, the soldier with the green whiskers led the lion to the great throne room and bade him enter the presence of Oz. The lion at once passed through the door and glancing around saw to his surprise that before the throne was a ball of fire so fierce and glowing he could scarcely bear to gaze upon it. His first thought was that Oz had by accident caught on fire and was burning up. But when he tried to go nearer, the heat was so intense that it singed his whiskers, and he crept back tremblingly to a spot nearer the door. Then a low, quiet voice came from the ball of fire, and these were the words it spoke. I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? And the lion answered, I am a cowardly lion, afraid of everything. I came to you to beg that you give me courage, so that in reality I may become the king of beasts, as men call me. Why should I give you courage? Because of all wizards, you are the greatest, and alone have power to grant my request. The ball of fire burned fiercely for a time, and the voice said, Bring me proof that the wicked witch is dead, and that moment I will give you courage. But as long as the witch lives, you must remain a coward. The lion was angry at this speech, but could say nothing in reply. And while he stood silently gazing at the ball of fire, it became so furiously hot 
that he turned tail and rushed from the room. He was glad to find his friends waiting for him and told them of his terrible interview with the wizard. What shall we do now? There is only one thing we can do, and that is to go to the land of the Winkies, seek out the Wicked Witch, and destroy her. But suppose we cannot? Then I shall never have courage. And I shall never have brains. And I shall never have a heart. And I shall never see Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. And Dorothy began to cry. The green girl cried, Be careful. The tears will fall on your green silk gown and spot it. So Dorothy dried her eyes and said, I suppose we must try it, but I am sure I do not want to kill anybody, even to see Aunt Em again. I will go with you, but I'm too much of a coward to kill the witch. I will go too, but I shall not be of much help to you. I am such a fool. I haven't the heart to harm even a witch, but if you go, I certainly shall go with you. Therefore, it was decided to start upon their journey the next morning. And the woodman sharpened his axe on a green grindstone and had all his joints properly oiled. The scarecrow stuffed himself with fresh straw, and Dorothy put new paint on his eyes that he might see better. The green girl, who was very kind to them, filled Dorothy's basket with good things to eat and fastened a little bell around Toto's neck with a green ribbon. They went to bed quite early, and slept soundly until daylight, when they were awakened by the crowing of a green cock that lived in the backyard of the palace, and the cackling of a hen that had laid a green egg. <laughs> Chapter 12, The Search for the Wicked Witch. The soldier with the green whiskers led them through the streets of the Emerald City until they reached the room where the guardian of the gates lived. This officer unlocked their spectacles to put them back in his great box, and then he politely opened the gate for our friends. Dorothy asked, Which road leads to the Wicked Witch of the West? The guardian of the gates answered, There is no road. No one ever wishes to go that way. How then are we to find her? That will be easy, for when she knows you are in the country of the Winkies, she will find you and make you all her slaves. The scarecrow said, Perhaps not. For we mean to destroy her. Oh, that is different. No one has ever destroyed her before, so I naturally thought she would make slaves of you as she has of the rest. But take care, for she is wicked and fierce and may not allow you to destroy her. Keep to the west where the sun sets and you cannot fail to find her. They thanked him and bade him goodbye and turned toward the west, walking over fields of soft grass, dotted here and there with daisies and buttercups. Dorothy still wore the pretty silk dress she had put on in the palace. But now, to her surprise, she found it was no longer green, but pure white. The ribbon around Toto's neck had also lost its green color and was as white as Dorothy's dress. The Emerald City was soon left far behind. As they advanced, the ground became rougher and hillier, for there were no farms nor houses in this country of the West, and the ground was untilled. In the afternoon, the sun shone hot in their faces, for there were no trees to offer them shade, so that before night, Dorothy and Toto and the lion were tired and lay down upon the grass and fell asleep, with the woodman and the scarecrow keeping watch. Now, the Wicked Witch of the West had but one eye, yet that was as powerful as a telescope and could see everywhere. So as she sat in the door of her castle, she happened to look around and saw Dorothy lying asleep with her friends all about her. They were a long distance off, but the Wicked Witch was angry to find them in her country, so she blew upon a silver whistle that hung around her neck. At once there came running to her from all directions a pack of great wolves. They had long legs and fierce eyes and sharp teeth, said the witch. Go to those people and tear them to pieces. The leader of the wolves asked, are you not going to make them your slaves? No. One is of tin and one of straw. One is a girl and another a lion. None of them is fit to work, so you may tear them into small pieces. Very well. And the wolf dashed away at full speed, followed by the others. It was lucky the scarecrow and the woodman were wide awake and heard the wolves coming. The woodman said, This is my fight, so get behind me and I will meet them as they come. He seized his axe, which he had made very sharp, and as the leader of the wolves came on, the tin woodman swung his arm and chopped the wolf's head from its body, 
so that it immediately died. As soon as he could raise his axe, another wolf came up, and he also fell under the sharp edge of the tin woodman's weapon. There were 40 wolves, and 40 times a wolf was killed, so that at last they all lay dead in a heap before the woodman. Then he put down his axe and sat beside the scarecrow, who said, It was a good fight, friend. They waited until Dorothy awoke the next morning. The little girl was quite frightened when she saw the great pile of shaggy wolves, but the tin woodman told her all. She thanked him for saving them and sat down to breakfast, after which they started again upon their journey. Now, this same morning, the wicked witch came to the door of her castle and looked out with her one eye that could see afar off. She saw all her wolves lying dead and the strangers still traveling through her country. This made her angrier than before, and she blew her silver whistle twice. Straightway, a great flock of wild crows came flying toward her, enough to darken the sky. And the wicked witch said to the king crow, Fly at once to the strangers. Pick out their eyes and tear them to pieces. The wild crows flew in one great flock toward Dorothy and her companions. When the little girl saw them coming, she was afraid. But the scarecrow said, This is my battle, so lie down beside me and you will not be harmed. So they all lay upon the ground except the scarecrow, and he stood up and stretched out his arms. And when the crows saw him, they were frightened, as these birds always are by scarecrows, and did not dare to come any nearer. But the king crow said, It is only a stuffed man. I will peck his eyes out. The king crow flew at the scarecrow, who caught it by the head and twisted its neck until it died. And then another crow flew at him, and the scarecrow twisted its neck also. There were 40 crows, and 40 times the scarecrow twisted a neck until at last all were lying dead beside him. Then he called to his companions to rise, and again they went upon their journey. When the wicked witch looked out again and saw all her crows lying in a heap, she got into a terrible rage and blew three times upon her silver whistle. Forthwith there was heard a great buzzing in the air, and a swarm of black bees came flying toward her. The witch commanded, Go to the strangers and sting them to death. And the bees turned and flew rapidly until they came to where Dorothy and her friends were walking. But the woodman had seen them coming and the scarecrow had decided what to do. He said to the woodman, Take out my straw and scatter it over the little girl and the dog and the lion, and the bees cannot sting them. This the woodman did. And as Dorothy lay close beside the lion and held Toto in her arms, the straw covered them entirely. The bees came and found no one but the woodman to sting. So they flew at him and broke off all their stings against the tin without hurting the woodman at all. And as bees cannot live when their stings are broken, that was the end of the black bees. And they lay scattered thick about the woodman like little heaps of fine coal. Then Dorothy and the lion got up and the girl helped the tin woodman put the straw back into the scarecrow again until he was as good as ever. So they started upon their journey once more. The wicked witch was so angry when she saw her black bees in little heaps like fine coal that she stamped her foot and tore her hair and gnashed her teeth. And then she called a dozen of her slaves, who were the Winkies, and gave them sharp spears, telling them to go to the strangers and destroy them. The Winkies were not a brave people, but they had to do as they were told. So they marched away until they came near to Dorothy. Then the lion gave a great roar and sprang toward them. And the poor Winkies were so frightened that they ran back as fast as they could. When they returned to the castle, the wicked witch beat them well with a strap and sent them back to their work, after which she sat down to think what she should do next. She could not understand how all her plans to destroy these strangers had failed. But she was a powerful witch as well as a wicked one, and she soon made up her mind how to act. There was in her cupboard a golden cap with a circle of diamonds and rubies running around it. This golden cap had a charm. Whoever owned it could call three times upon the winged monkeys who would obey any order they were given. But no person could command these strange creatures more than three times. Twice already the wicked witch had used the charm of the cap. Once was when she had made the winkies her slaves and set herself to rule over their country. The winged monkeys had helped her do this. The second time was when she had fought against the great Oz himself and driven him out of the land of the West. The winged monkeys had also helped her in doing this. Only once more could she use this golden cap, 
for which reason she did not like to do so until all her other powers were exhausted. But now that her fierce wolves and her wild crows and her stinging bees were gone, and her slaves had been scared away by the cowardly lion, she saw there was only one way left to destroy Dorothy and her friends. So the wicked witch took the golden cap from her cupboard and placed it upon her head. Then she stood upon her left foot and said slowly, Eppy, Peppy, Catty. Next she stood upon her right foot and said, Hello, Hollow, Hello. After this she stood upon both feet and cried in a loud voice, Zizzy, Zazzy, Zip. Now the charm began to work. The sky was darkened, and a low rumbling sound was heard in the air. There was a rushing of many wings, a great chattering and laughing, and the sun came out of the dark sky to show the wicked witch, surrounded by a crowd of monkeys, each with a pair of immense and powerful wings on his shoulders. One, much bigger than the others, seemed to be their leader. He flew close to the witch and said, You have called us for the third and last time. What do you command? The wicked witch said, Go to the strangers who are within my land and destroy them all except the lion. Bring that beast to me, for I have a mind to harness him like a horse and make him work. The leader said, Your command shall be obeyed. And then with a great deal of chattering and noise, the winged monkeys flew away to the place where Dorothy and her friends were walking. Some of the monkeys seized the tin woodman and carried him through the air until they were over a country thickly covered with sharp rocks. Here they dropped the poor woodman, who fell a great distance to the rocks, where he lay so battered and dented that he could neither move nor groan. Others of the monkeys caught the scarecrow, and with their long fingers pulled all of the straw out of his clothes and head. They made his hat and boots and clothes into a small bundle and threw it into the top branches of a tall tree. The remaining monkeys threw pieces of stout rope around the lion and wound many coils about his body and head and legs until he was unable to bite or scratch or struggle in any way. Then they lifted him up and flew away with him to the witch's castle where he was placed in a small yard with a high iron fence around it so that he could not escape. But Dorothy, they did not harm at all. She stood with Toto in her arms, watching the sad fate of her comrades and thinking it would soon be her turn. The leader of the winged monkeys flew up to her, his long, hairy arms stretched out and his ugly face grinning terribly. But he saw the mark of the good witch's kiss upon her forehead and stopped short, motioning the others not to touch her. He said to them, We dare not harm this little girl, for she is protected by the power of good, and that is greater than the power of evil. All we can do is to carry her to the castle of the Wicked Witch and leave her there. So carefully and gently they lifted Dorothy in their arms and carried her swiftly through the air until they came to the castle where they set her down upon the front doorstep. Then the leader said to the witch, We have obeyed you as far as we were able. The tin woodman and the scarecrow are destroyed and the lion is tied up in your yard. The little girl we dare not harm, nor the dog she carries in her arms. Your power over our band is now ended, and you will never see us again. Then all the winged monkeys, with much laughing and chattering and noise, flew into the air and were soon out of sight. The wicked witch was both surprised and worried when she saw the mark on Dorothy's forehead, for she knew well that neither the winged monkeys nor she herself dare hurt the girl in any way. She looked down at Dorothy's feet, and seeing the silver shoes, began to tremble with fear, for she knew what a powerful charm belonged to them. At first, the witch was tempted to run away from Dorothy, but she happened to look into the child's eyes and saw how simple the soul behind them was, and that the little girl did not know of the wonderful power the silver shoes gave her. So the wicked witch laughed to herself and thought, I can still make her my slave, for she does not know how to use her power. Then she said to Dorothy harshly and severely, Come with me and see that you mind everything I tell you, for if you do not, I will make an end of you, as I did of the tin woodman and the scarecrow. Dorothy followed her through many of the beautiful rooms in her castle until they came to the kitchen, where the witch bade her clean the pots and kettles and sweep the floor and keep the fire fed with wood. Dorothy went to work meekly, with her mind made up to work as hard as she could, for she was glad the wicked witch had decided not to kill her. With Dorothy hard at work, 
the witch thought she would go into the courtyard and harness the cowardly lion like a horse. It would amuse her. She was sure to make him draw her chariot whenever she wished to go to drive. But as she opened the gate, the lion gave a loud roar and bounded at her so fiercely that the witch was afraid and ran out and shut the gate again. The witch said to the lion, speaking through the bars of the gate, If I cannot harness you, I can starve you. You should have nothing to eat until you do as I wish. So after that, she took no food to the imprisoned lion. But every day she came to the gate at noon and asked, Are you ready to be harnessed like a horse? And the lion would answer, No, if you come in this yard, I will bite you. The reason the lion did not have to do as the witch wished was that every night while the woman was asleep, Dorothy carried him food from the cupboard. After he had eaten, he would lie down on his bed of straw, and Dorothy would lie beside him and put her head on his soft, shaggy mane while they talked of their troubles and tried to plan some way to escape. But they could find no way to get out of the castle, for it was constantly guarded by the yellow Winkies, who were the slaves of the wicked witch, and too afraid of her not to do as she told them. The girl had to work hard during the day, and often the witch threatened to beat her with the same old umbrella she always carried in her hand. But in truth, she did not dare to strike Dorothy because of the mark upon her forehead. The child did not know this and was full of fear for herself and Toto. Once the witch struck Toto a blow with her umbrella, and the brave little dog flew at her and bit her leg in return. The witch did not bleed where she was bitten for she was so wicked that the blood in her had dried up many years before. Dorothy's life became very sad as she grew to understand that it would be harder than ever to get back to Kansas and Aunt Em again. Sometimes she would cry bitterly for hours, with Toto sitting at her feet and looking into her face, whining dismally to show how sorry he was for his little mistress. Toto did not really care whether he was in Kansas or the land of Oz, so long as Dorothy was with him. But he knew the little girl was unhappy, and that made him unhappy, too. Now, the wicked witch had a great longing to have for her own the silver shoes which the girl always wore. Her bees and her crows and her wolves were lying in heaps and drying up, and she had used up all the power of the golden cap. But if she could only get hold of the silver shoes, they would give her more power than all the other things she had lost. She watched Dorothy carefully to see if she ever took off her shoes, thinking she might steal them. But the child was so proud of her pretty shoes that she never took them off except at night and when she took her bath. The witch was too much afraid of the dark to dare go in Dorothy's room at night to take the shoes. And her dread of water was greater than her fear of the dark, so she never came near when Dorothy was bathing. Indeed, the old witch never touched water, nor ever let water touch her in any way. But the wicked creature was very cunning, and she finally thought of a trick that would give her what she wanted. She placed a bar of iron in the middle of the kitchen floor, and then by her magic arts made the iron invisible to human eyes, so that when Dorothy walked across the floor, she stumbled over the bar, not being able to see it, and fell at full length. She was not much hurt, but in her fall, one of the silver shoes came off, and before she could reach it, the witch had snatched it away and put it on her own skinny foot. The wicked woman was greatly pleased with the success of her trick, for as long as she had one of the shoes, she owned half the power of their charm, and Dorothy could not use it against her, even had she known how to do so. The little girl, seeing she had lost one of her pretty shoes, grew angry and said to the witch, Give me back my shoe. I will not, for it is now my shoe and not yours. You are a wicked creature. You had no right to take my shoe from me. The witch said, laughing at her, I shall keep it just the same, and someday I shall get the other one from you, too. This made Dorothy so very angry that she picked up the bucket of water that stood near and dashed it over the witch, wetting her from head to foot. <coughs> Instantly, the wicked woman gave a loud cry of fear. And then, as Dorothy looked at her in wonder, the witch began to shrink and fall away. See what you have done. In a minute, I shall melt away. I'm very sorry indeed. Dorothy was truly frightened to see the witch actually melting away like brown sugar before her very eyes. The witch asked in a wailing, despairing voice, Didn't you know water would be the end of me? Of course not. How should I? Well, 
In a few minutes, I shall be all melted, and you will have the castle to yourself. I have been wicked in my day, but I never thought a little girl like you would ever be able to melt me and end my wicked deeds. Look out! Here I go! With these words, the witch fell down in a brown, melted, shapeless mass and began to spread over the clean boards of the kitchen floor, seeing that she had really melted away to nothing. Dorothy drew another bucket of water and threw it over the mess. She then swept it all out the door. After picking out the silver shoe, which was all that was left of the old woman, she cleaned and dried it with a cloth and put it on her foot again. Then, being at last free to do as she chose, she ran out to the courtyard to tell the lion that the wicked witch of the West had come to an end and that they were no longer prisoners in a strange land. Chapter 13, The Rescue. The cowardly lion was much pleased to hear that the wicked witch had been melted by a bucket of water, and Dorothy at once unlocked the gate of his prison and set him free. They went in together to the castle, where Dorothy's first act was to call all the Winkies together and tell them that they were no longer slaves. There was great rejoicing among the yellow Winkies, for they had been made to work hard during many years for the wicked witch, who had always treated them with great cruelty. They kept this day as a holiday, then and ever after, and spent the time in feasting and dancing. Said the lion, If our friends the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman were only with us, I should be quite happy. Don't you suppose we could rescue them? We can try. So they called the Yellow Winkies and asked them if they would help to rescue their friends. And the Winkies said that they would be delighted to do all in their power for Dorothy, who had set them free from bondage. So she chose a number of the Winkies who looked as if they knew the most, and they all started away. They traveled that day and part of the next, until they came to the rocky plain where the Tin Woodman lay all battered and bent. His axe was near him, but the blade was rusted and the handle broken off short. The Winkies lifted him tenderly in their arms and carried him back to the Yellow Castle again. Dorothy shedding a few tears by the way at the sad plight of her old friend and the lion looking sober and sorry. When they reached the castle, Dorothy said to the Winkies, Are any of your people tinsmiths? They told her, Oh, yes. Some of them are very good tinsmiths. Then bring them to me. And when the tinsmiths came, bringing with them all their tools in baskets, she inquired, Can you straighten out those dents in the tin woodman and bend him back into shape again and solder him together where he is broken? The tinsmiths looked the woodman over carefully and then answered that they thought they could mend him so he would be as good as ever. So they set to work in one of the big yellow rooms of the castle and worked for three days and four nights, hammering and twisting and bending and soldering and polishing and pounding at the legs and body and head of the tin woodman, until at last he was straightened out into his old form and his joints worked as well as ever. To be sure, there were several patches on him, but the tinsmiths did a good job and as the woodman was not a vain man, he did not mind the patches at all. When at last he walked into Dorothy's room and thanked her for rescuing him, he was so pleased that he wept tears of joy, and Dorothy had to wipe every tear carefully from his face with her apron so his joints would not be rusted. At the same time, her own tears fell thick and fast at the joy of meeting her old friend again, and these tears did not need to be wiped away. As for the lion, he wiped his eyes so often with the tip of his tail that it became quite wet, and he was obliged to go out into the courtyard and hold it in the sun till it dried. When Dorothy had finished telling him everything that had happened, the tin woodman said, If we only had the scarecrow with us again, I should be quite happy. We must try to find him. So she called the Winkies to help her, and they walked all that day and part of the next, until they came to the tall tree, in the branches of which the winged monkeys had tossed the scarecrow's clothes. 
It was a very tall tree, and the trunk was so smooth that no one could climb it. But the woodman said at once, I'll chop it down, and then we can get the scarecrow's clothes. Now, while the tinsmiths had been at work mending the woodman himself, another of the Winkies, who was a goldsmith, had made an axe handle of solid gold and fitted it to the woodman's axe instead of the old broken handle. Others polished the blade until all the rust was removed and it glistened like burnished silver. As soon as he had spoken, the tin woodman began to chop, and in a short time the tree fell over with a crash. When the scarecrow's clothes fell out of the branches and rolled off on the ground, Dorothy picked them up and had the Winkies carry them back to the castle, where they were stuffed with nice, clean straw. And behold, here was the scarecrow as good as ever, thanking them over and over again for saving him. Now that they were reunited, Dorothy and her friends spent a few happy days at the Yellow Castle, where they found everything they needed to make them comfortable. But one day, the girl thought of Aunt Em and said, We must go back to Oz and claim his promise, said the woodman. Yes, at last I shall get my heart. The scarecrow added joyfully, And I shall get my brains. The lion said thoughtfully, And I shall get my courage. Dorothy cried, clapping her hands. And I shall get back to Kansas. Oh, let us start for the Emerald City tomorrow. This they decided to do. The next day they called the Winkies together and bade them goodbye. The Winkies were sorry to have them go, and they had grown so fond of the Tin Woodman that they begged him to stay and rule over them and the yellow land of the West. Finding they were determined to go, the Winkies gave Toto and the lion each a golden collar. And to Dorothy, they presented a beautiful bracelet studded with diamonds. And to the Scarecrow, they gave a gold-headed walking stick to keep him from stumbling. And to the Tin Woodman, they offered a silver oil can inlaid with gold and set with precious jewels. Every one of the travelers made the Winkies a pretty speech in return, and all shook hands with them until their arms ached. Dorothy went to the witch's cupboard to fill her basket with food for the journey, and there she saw the golden cap. She tried it on her own head and found that it fitted her exactly. She did not know anything about the charm of the golden cap, but she saw that it was pretty, so she made up her mind to wear it and carry her sunbonnet in the basket. Then, being prepared for the journey, they all started for the Emerald City, and the Winkies gave them three cheers and many good wishes to carry with them. Chapter 14, The Winged Monkeys. You will remember there was no road, not even a pathway, between the castle of the Wicked Witch and the Emerald City. When the four travelers went in search of the witch, she had seen them coming, and so sent the winged monkeys to bring them to her. It was much harder to find their way back through the big fields of buttercups and bright daisies than it was being carried. They knew, of course, they must go straight east toward the rising sun, and they started off in the right way. But at noon, when the sun was over their heads, they did not know which was east and which was west, and that was the reason they were lost in the great fields. They kept on walking, however, and at night the moon came out and shone brightly. So they lay down among the sweet-smelling scarlet flowers and slept soundly until morning, all but the scarecrow and the tin woodman. The next morning the sun was behind a cloud, but they started on as if they were quite sure which way they were going. If we walk far enough, we shall sometime come to some place, I am sure. But day by day passed away, and they still saw nothing before them but the scarlet fields. The scarecrow began to grumble a bit. We have surely lost our way, and unless we find it again in time to reach the Emerald City, I shall never get my brains. Nor I, my heart. It seems to me I can scarcely wait till I get to Oz, and you must admit this is a very long journey. You see, I haven't the courage to keep tramping forever without getting anywhere at all. Then Dorothy lost heart. She sat down on the grass and looked at her companions, and they sat down and looked at her, and Toto found that for the first time in his life he was too tired to chase a butterfly that flew past his head. So he put out his tongue and panted, and looked at Dorothy as if to ask what they should do next. Suppose we call the field mice. They could probably tell us the way to the Emerald City. To be sure, they could. Why didn't we think of that before? Dorothy blew the little whistle she had always carried about her neck 
since the queen of the mice had given it to her. In a few minutes, they heard the pattering of tiny feet, and many of the small gray mice came running up to her. Among them was the queen herself, who asked in her squeaky little voice, What can I do for my friends? We have lost our way. Can you tell us where the Emerald City is? Certainly, but it is a great way off, for you have had it at your backs all this time. Then she noticed Dorothy's golden cap and said, I didn't know there was a charm. What is it? It is written inside the golden cap. But if you are going to call the winged monkeys, we must run away, for they are full of mischief and think it great fun to plague us. Won't they hurt me? Oh, no. They must obey the wearer of the cap. Goodbye. And she scampered out of sight with all the mice hurrying after her. Dorothy looked inside the golden cap and saw some words written upon the lining. These, she thought, must be the charm. So she read the directions carefully and put the cap upon her head. Standing on her left foot, she said, Epi, Peppy, Khaki. What did you say? The scarecrow did not know what she was doing. Standing this time on her right foot, Dorothy went on, Hello, hollow, hello. The tin woodman replied calmly, Hello. Zizzy, Zuzzy, Zick! Dorothy was now standing on both feet. This ended the saying of the charm, and they heard a great chattering and flapping of wings as the band of winged monkeys flew up to them. The king bowed low before Dorothy and asked, What is your command? We wish to go to the Emerald City, and we have lost our way. We will carry you. No sooner had he spoken than two of the monkeys caught Dorothy in their arms and flew away with her. Others took the scarecrow and the woodman and the lion, and one little monkey seized Toto and flew after them, although the dog tried hard to bite him. The scarecrow and the tin woodman were rather frightened at first, for they remembered how badly the winged monkeys had treated them before. But they saw that no harm was intended, so they rode through the air quite cheerfully and had a fine time looking at the pretty gardens and woods far below them. Dorothy found herself riding easily between two of the biggest monkeys, one of them the king himself. They had made a chair of their hands and were careful not to hurt her. Why do you have to obey the charm of the golden cap? The king answered with a laugh. That is a long story. But as we have a long journey before us, I will pass the time by telling you about it, if you wish. I shall be glad to hear it. Once we were a free people living happily in the great forest, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts and fruit and doing just as we pleased without calling anybody master. Perhaps some of us were rather too full of mischief at times, flying down to pull the tails of the animals that had no wings, chasing birds and throwing nuts at the people who walked in the forest. But we were careless and happy and full of fun and enjoyed every minute of the day. This was many years ago, long before Oz came out of the clouds to rule over this land. There lived here then, away at the north, a beautiful princess who was also a powerful sorceress. All her magic was used to help the people, and she was never known to hurt anyone who was good. Her name was Gaylette, and she lived in a handsome palace built from great blocks of ruby. Everyone loved her, but her greatest sorrow was that she could find no one to love in return, since all the men were much too stupid and ugly to meet with one so beautiful and wise. At last, however, she found a boy who was handsome and manly and wise beyond his years. Gaylette made up her mind that when he grew to be a man, she would make him her husband. So she took him to her ruby palace and used all her magic powers to make him as strong and good and lovely as any woman could wish. When he grew to manhood, Quelala, as he was called, was said to be the best and wisest man in all the land, while his manly beauty was so great that Gaylette loved him dearly and hastened to make everything ready for the wedding. My grandfather was at that time the king of the winged monkeys, which lived in the forest near Gaylette's palace, and the old fellow loved a joke better than a good dinner. One day, just before the wedding, my grandfather was flying out with his band when he saw Quelala walking beside the river. 
He was dressed in a rich costume of pink silk and purple velvet, and my grandfather thought he would see what he could do. At his word, the band flew down and seized Quilala, carried him in their arms until they were over the middle of the river, and then dropped him into the water. Swim out, my fine fellow, cried my grandfather, and see if the water has spotted your clothes. Quilala was much too wise not to swim, and he was not in the least spoiled by all his good fortune. He laughed when he came to the top of the water and swam into shore. But when Gaelic came running out to him, she found his silks and velvet all ruined by the river. The princess was angry, and she knew, of course, who did it. She had all the winged monkeys brought before her, and she said at first that their wings should be tied, and they should be treated as they had treated Quilala and dropped in the river. But my grandfather pleaded hard, for he knew the monkeys would drown in the river with their wings tied. And Quilala said a kind word for them also, so that Gaelet finally spared them on condition that the winged monkeys should ever after do three times the bidding of the owner of the golden cap. This cap had been made for a wedding present to Quilala, and it is said to have cost the princess half her kingdom. Of course, my grandfather and all the other monkeys at once agreed to the condition, and that is how it happens that we are three times the slaves of the owner of the golden cap, whosoever he may be. Dorothy, who had been greatly interested in the story, asked, And what became of them? Quilala, being the first owner of the golden cap, he was the first to lay his wishes upon us. As his bride could not bear the sight of us, he called us all to him in the forest after he had married her and ordered us always to keep where she could never again set eyes on a winged monkey, which we were glad to do, for we were all afraid of her. This was all we ever had to do until the golden cap fell into the hands of the wicked witch of the West, who made us enslave the winkies and afterward drive Oz himself out of the land of the West. Now the golden cap is yours, and three times you have the right to lay your wishes upon us. As the Monkey King finished his story, Dorothy looked down and saw the green, shining walls of the Emerald City before them. She wondered at the rapid flight of the monkeys, but was glad the journey was over. The strange creature set the travelers down carefully before the gate of the city. The king bowed low to Dorothy, and then flew swiftly away, followed by all his band. That was a good ride. Yes, and a quick way out of our troubles. How lucky it was you brought away that wonderful cap. Chapter 15, The Discovery of Oz the Terrible. The four travelers walked up to the great gate of Emerald City and rang the bell. After ringing several times, it was opened by the same guardian of the gates they had met before. He asked in surprise, What? Are you back again? Do you not see us? But I thought you had gone to visit the Wicked Witch of the West. We did visit her. And she let you go again? She could not help it, for she is melted. Melted? Well, that is good news indeed. Who melted her? It was Dorothy. Good gracious! And the man bowed very low indeed before her. Then he led them into his little room and locked the spectacles from the great box on all their eyes, just as he had done before. Afterward, they passed on through the gate into the Emerald City, and when the people heard from the guardian of the gates that they had melted the Wicked Witch of the West, they all gathered around the travelers and followed them in a great crowd to the Palace of Oz. The soldier with the green whiskers was still on guard before the door but he let them in at once, and they were again met by the beautiful green girl, who showed each of them to their old rooms at once, so they might rest until the great Oz was ready to receive them. The soldier had the news carried straight to Oz that Dorothy and the other travelers had come back again after destroying the wicked witch. But Oz made no reply. They thought the great wizard would send for them at once, but he did not. They had no word from him the next day, nor the next, nor the next. The waiting was tiresome and wearing, and at last they grew vexed that Oz should treat them in so poor a fashion after sending them to undergo hardships and slavery. So the Scarecrow at last asked the Green Girl to take another message to Oz, 
saying if he did not let them in to see him at once, they would call the winged monkeys to help them and find out whether he kept his promises or not. When the wizard was given this message, he was so frightened that he sent word for them to come to the throne room at four minutes after nine o'clock the next morning. He had once met the winged monkeys in the land of the west, and he did not wish to meet them again. The four travelers passed a sleepless night, each thinking of the gift Oz had promised to bestow on him. Dorothy fell asleep only once, and then she dreamed she was in Kansas, where Aunt Em was telling her how glad she was to have her little girl at home again. Promptly at nine o'clock the next morning, the green-whiskered soldier came to them, and four minutes later they all went into the throne room of the great Oz. Of course, each one of them expected to see the wizard in the shape he had taken before, and all were greatly surprised when they looked about and saw no one at all in the room. They kept close to the door and closer to one another, for the stillness of the empty room was more dreadful than any of the forms they had seen Oz take. Presently, they heard a voice seeming to come from somewhere near the top of the great dome, and it said solemnly, I am Oz the Great and Terrible. Why do you seek me? They looked again in every part of the room, and then seeing no one, Dorothy asked, Where are you? I am everywhere, but to the eyes of common mortals I am invisible. I will now seat myself upon my throne that you may converse with me. Indeed, the voice seemed just then to come straight from the throne itself. So they walked toward it and stood in a row, while Dorothy said, We have come to claim our promise, O oh Oz. What promise? You promised to send me back to Kansas when the Wicked Witch was destroyed. And you promised to give me brains. And you promised to give me a heart. And you promise to give me courage. Is the Wicked Witch really destroyed? Dorothy thought the voice trembled a little. Yes, I melted her with a bucket of water. Dear me, how sudden. Well, come to me tomorrow, for I must have time to think it over. You've had plenty of time already. We shan't wait a day longer. You must keep your promises to us. The lion thought it might be as well to frighten the wizard. So he gave a large, loud roar, which was so fierce and dreadful that Toto jumped away from him in alarm and tipped over the screen that stood in a corner. As it fell with a crash, they looked that way, and the next moment all of them were filled with wonder, for they saw standing in just the spot the screen had hidden a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face who seemed to be as much surprised as they were. The tin woodman, raising his axe, rushed toward the little man and cried out, Who are you? The little man said in a trembling voice, I am Oz, the great and terrible, but don't strike me, please don't, and I'll do anything you want me to. Our friends looked at him in surprise and dismay. I thought Oz was a great head. And I thought Oz was a lovely lady. And I thought Oz was a terrible beast. And I thought Oz was a ball of fire. The little man said meekly, No, you were all wrong. I have been making believe. Making believe? Are you not a great wizard? Hush, my dear. Don't speak so loud or you will be overheard and I should be ruined. I'm supposed to be a great wizard. And aren't you? Not a bit of it, my dear. I'm just a common man. You're more than that. You're a humbug. Exactly so. I am a humbug. The little man rubbed his hands together as if it pleased him. But this is terrible. How shall I ever get my heart? Or I, my courage. Or I, my brains. The scarecrow wiped the tears from his eyes with his coat sleeve. My dear friends, I pray you not to speak of these little things. Think of me and the terrible trouble I'm in at being found out. Doesn't anyone else know you're a humbug? No one knows it but you four and myself. I have fooled everyone so long that I thought I should never be found out. It was a great mistake my ever letting you into the throne room. Usually I will not even see my subjects, and so they believe I am something terrible. But I don't understand. How was it that you appeared to me as a great head? That was one of my tricks. 
Step this way, please, and I will tell you all about it. He led the way to a small chamber in the rear of the throne room, and they all followed him. He pointed to one corner in which lay the great head made out of many thicknesses of paper and with a carefully painted face. This I hung from the ceiling by a wire. I stood behind the screen and pulled a thread to make the eyes move and the mouth open. But how about the voice? Oh, I am a ventriloquist, and I can throw the sound of my voice wherever I wish so that you thought it was coming out of the head. Here are the other things I used to deceive you. He showed the scarecrow the dress and the mask he had worn when he seemed to be the lovely lady, and the tin woodman saw that his terrible beast was nothing but a lot of skins sewn together with slats to keep their sides out. As for the ball of fire, the false wizard had hung that also from the ceiling. It was really a ball of cotton, but when oil was poured upon it, the ball burned fiercely. Really, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for being such a humbug. I am. I certainly am. But it was the only thing I could do. Sit down, please. There are plenty of chairs, and I will tell you my story. So they sat down and listened while he told the following tale. I was born in Omaha. Why, that isn't very far from Kansas. He shook his head at her sadly. No, but it's farther from here. When I grew up, I became a ventriloquist, and at that I was very well trained by a great master. I can imitate any kind of a bird or beast. Here he mewed so like a kitten that Toto pricked up his ears and looked everywhere to see where she was. After a time, I tired of that and became a balloonist. What is that? A man who goes up in a balloon on circus day so as to draw a crowd of people together and get them to pay to see the circus. Oh, I know. Well, one day I went up in a balloon and the ropes got twisted so that I couldn't come down again. It went way up above the clouds, so far that a current of air struck it and carried it many, many miles away. For a day and a night, I traveled through the air, and on the morning of the second day, I awoke and found the balloon floating over a strange and beautiful country. It came down gradually, and I was not hurt a bit, but I found myself in the midst of a strange people who, seeing me come from the clouds, thought I was a great wizard. Of course, I let them think so because they were afraid of me and promised to do anything I wished them to. Just to amuse myself and keep the good people busy, I ordered them to build this city and my palace, and they did it all willingly and well. Then I thought, as the country was so green and beautiful, I would call it the Emerald City. And to make the name fit better, I put green spectacles on all the people so that everything they saw was green. But isn't everything here green? No more than in any other city. But when you wear green spectacles, why, of course, everything you see looks green to you. <laughs>